All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our first virtual exhibition opening and artist talk. And thank you, Greta Fairbanks, our ASL interpreter, for being here this evening. I'm Janie Krinas, Curator of Academic Affairs and Community Engagement here at the Phillips Museum of Art at Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. We are so pleased to be able to open this amazing exhibition today, organized through Catherine T. Carter and Associates. While the physical space is only open to FNM faculty, staff, and students, we are excited to connect with a larger audience through our online exhibition and programming. Attendees will be able to post questions to the Q&A box throughout the presentation. Lexi Brynick, Phillips Museum Assistant, will join us after Francie's presentation and moderate the discussion to conclude our program. So let's get started. Francie Lyshak studied art history at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, then traveled to Paris to study painting for a summer. Returning to the United States, she studied for a BFA at the Center for Creative Studies in Wayne State University, both in Detroit. Later, she earned an MPS in Creative Arts Therapy from Pratt Institute in New York. Making use of her graduate training, Lyshek designed and led community art service programs in New York and New Orleans and launched an art therapy program at Bronx Children's Psychiatric Hospital. This professional immersion in art as a therapeutic tool influenced the focus of her subsequent visual practice on psychological experience. Lyshak began her artistic career in New York's East Village in the 1970s, developing a style of painting that explores emotional themes from a feminist perspective. In 1993, she staged a key exhibition, The Secret, that explored her recovery from childhood sexual abuse and published an accompanying book of the same title. Often turning her focus inward to stare down and pick apart a lifetime of personal experience, some of it highly traumatic, Lyshak offers viewers a cascade of stories and spaces into which they can immerse themselves spiritually and emotionally as well as visually. Lyshak wields her knowledge of painting as a tool for surveying the landscapes of mind and heart. During the 1970s, Lyshak developed a style of painting that deviated from the prevailing trends of minimalism, pop, and conceptual art. Combining dreamlike images of dolls and toys with human and animal figures, Lyshak draws on her experiences to conjure hauntingly elusive scenes with something of the quality of modern myths. Aiming to transcend the purely rational by establishing spaces for dreaming, reflection and emotional exploration. Francie, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Hey, hi. There, hi everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. And thank you for that wonderful introduction, Janie. All right, I am going to uh, uh, screen share here and go through my paintings with all of you one at a time, Let's see, bear with me. Okay. All right, uh, this is me in my studio. I don't need to say much about my history. Janie's really covered that pretty well. But today I was thinking, what do I have to offer all of you? And in the world, you know, we have a, a uh, pandemic, we have a climate crisis, and we have an impeachment uh, going on, with, you know, a lot of craziness in our government. And um, so the question is, what, what makes the, these paintings relevant? And what I would say is that when I was doing this work, I was uh, in a major turning point in my life kind of the beginning, the middle, and the end. Uh, this was going on during these paintings. And so a lot of the paintings are um, about dealing with the unknown. And sometimes it's fear of the unknown. Sometimes it's avoidance of fear. Sometimes it's 
pure fear or being fearless. But uh, I think that uh, my, my goal is always to connect with people through emotions and because that's what we have in common. We may have emotional um, responses for different reasons, but we all share the same emotions. So that's how I hope to connect with all of you today. So Little Horace refers to my last name. It's, it's kind of a self-portrait, but I feel that this painting is uh, it's a, a moment of solitude when it's perfect. So this horse, you'll see there are a lot of horses and dolls and dogs and birds and snakes in my paintings. They were favorite characters. Uh, but the horse for me is an intuitive animal. It's a powerful animal and it's a um, beautiful animal. So this horse is happily grazing in a, in a wonderful, um, safe, landscape. Here we have another horse. This is the horse and a raven. For me, this painting is like a friendship. These, the bird, this horse is a blind horse and that was not my intention, but the painting, sometimes the painting tells you what it wants to become. I mean, that's pretty much always what happens when I'm working. But in this case, the, the uh, horse is blind, he's powerful, he's intuitive, but he is blind and he has this raven and the raven is quick and bright and agile. And so together they are, you know, they're a, a good strong team. This next painting is Adventures at Sea. And um, in this painting, you see a big wave looming behind her. She's, again, she has, uh, the horse theme is back. She's uh, riding the waves with this very uh, kind of vulnerable little flotation device. She doesn't seem to be aware of this looming wave in the background. So there is a sense of vulnerability here. Now we have attachment. And when I uh, call it attachment, I'm talking about relationships, uh, romantic relationships. In this case, there's a snake. Now I, I think of snakes as predators as dangerous, but I also think of them as very um, fragile creatures in a way because they, uh, when I was painting the snake, I thought, what would it be like to be a snake? And they're crawling on their belly, they have no arms. So it's, there's this mixed feeling about the snake. Anyway, he's wrapped his body around this rose in full bloom in its most perfect moment. And, but there's this kind of scary thing going on with the dove in the background. And it feels like the snake might be preparing to lurch at the dove. So there's danger implied in this painting. Danger and there's love. This is every man nears the summit. I did a few paintings that started with the word every man. And I think that points to my um, hope to, um, that I'm trying to capture something that's common to all of us. So in this case, it's a snow monkey and he's, he's near the top of the mountain, but he has this bewildered look on his face. Like what, what have I done? <laughs> like a, a cat that's climbed a tree, now what? And uh, it's very steep beneath him. Again, we have soaring birds, glorious landscape, but there's this underlying sense of danger. Finally, we have fire. This was a uh, part of a series of four paintings, my uh, disaster series. And this was, um, these were paintings I did when I came to realize that uh, 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 
a neighbor had done something terrible to me when I was a child. And, uh, and of course I had forgotten it because I was a very young child. And, uh, but still that sense of catastrophe, the world is ending, the world is, is, is collapsing. That's what I was trying to present in this painting. And um, it's the danger we all feel at one point or another in our lives. So next I have uh, something called tightrope walker. And here, here we have a lot of danger. I mean, this, this juggler is doing fine on the rope, but there's a snake at each end. There's a ring of fire. There's an agitated lion. Uh, uh, it's, there's kind of no exit, but still we have this glorious landscape in the background. And, and I was thinking about why do I always have these glorious landscapes? I think that it, it, for me, the landscape references beauty and art and culture, because that is the one thing that we can all turn to uh, when, when somehow artists have figured out how to make something glorious out of uh, life as we know it. So I, I think that's why I've always got the landscape there as an anchor. The next slide, I collected dolls and I did use the dolls. I did a whole doll series. I used the dolls to, um, as models and I made this painting from those dolls. This painting is called Me, Myself, and I. So this painting is not so much about danger outside as the, um, an internal crisis for these figures, like a divided self. And uh, me is the, this doll here. And when I look at this doll, such a, he's such a tender, sweet doll, but so seems so um, afraid and, and threatened and oppressed. Um, and then we have this doll, the blonde doll, who looks to me so broken and, um, like she's given up. And, but here we have a power figure, the wolf or dog, you never know which one it is, but it's certainly a guardian kind of figure and a powerful figure that's capable of being, um, uh, capable of doing violence to protect the, the uh, the, the one that the dog is loyal to. So it's a safety figure. So after I did this, that's when I, this was around the time when I did the book called The Secret, which was a grouping of about, mm, I don't know, 12, 15 paintings. And they, I guess what I need to say is that the, the paintings led the discovery of what was unknown in my life. I had nightmares. I did these scary paintings. I didn't know why. Uh, and so sometimes art can lead the way to self-discovery. Even viewing art can lead the way to self-discovery. It's not just making art. I'm sure we all find ourselves in books and in music all the time. This is the last page of that book. It's called Companions. And so this painting is, uh, the, the text under this particular page in the book is She Dreams of Trusting Again. The idea being that, uh, that trauma can break people uh, and fear can divide people from one another. And so the, the point here is that trust can be rekindled. Trust can grow out of the ashes of 
trauma. The book, by the way, is out of print, but you can, if you're interested in that material, you can find it on my website at francielyshek.com in the um, projects section. So now uh, these paintings are more of an exploration of relationships. This one called Dalhouse Kitchen is a family scene, a kitchen scene, and here we have a needy child always wanting more attention, wanting the mother, and but the mother is wanting and yearning for uh, the, the beauty outside, the, this free-spirited bird. Uh, and we have the dog who's like a soldier and a witness to this family scene. This is Dollhouse Nursery. This painting and my the next one are my, they have a comedic side to it, at least when I look at it. And, and I, so one thing I didn't say to you before is that when I do a painting, I always feel that every part of the painting is an aspect of self. It's, it re references a kind of a way of mm, doing dream interpretation. So, so in this painting, I guess when you look at it, you, one way to look at it would be to say, I am the mule. I have the personality of the mule. I am the sheep. I am the goat. I am a pig. I am a rooster and all the, the um, characteristics that go with those animals. Anyway, the poor uh, nursemaid there is trying to keep it all in order. And this one is after the wedding, which actually I did do uh, one year after I got married. And you can see um, this sweet couple who, who are close together are surrounded by, you know, the uh, a world of the unknown sea monsters, albatross, walruses, dolphins, whales. So there's danger. There's also a sense of surrender, but they have each other. This is swimmers seeking each other. Again, this looks at relationships, intimate relationships. They're naked. Um, the fish, I think, speak to our animal nature, our primitive nature, and they're always circling one another, trying to connect. This is another doll I used for, whoops, oops, sorry, sorry. I use that doll for this painting. This is called Leather Doll. This doll was given to me by David Vonarovich. Some of you might know his name. He uh, was a wonderful, radical artist and he died. Uh, where this was done in 1994. The AIDS epidemic was uh, savaging my community in the East Village, New York City. And David did die, had died, I think, a little bit prior to this. And it, it is my way of not only, hmm, it's my way of looking hard at mortality and the meaning. It's kind of a meditation on mortality, as is this next painting, Shayla's Journey, Shayla Baikal. It references Shayla Baikal, who was a photographer in the East Village, again, part of my community. And um, she, she took wonderful photographs of uh, the theater, especially the gay theater scene in East Village, which was really thriving at the time. And she died of cancer secondary to a horrific traumatic experience. And again, this is kind of a meditation on loss, <clears throat> leaving, mortality. This is flying. 
did have a number of flying dreams throughout my life, nothing lately. But I, in this painting, the, the person flying is free of gravity, free of, free of the minutia of life. It's a very uplifting painting. This is the waiter. I think of these as kind of meditations because uh, we have a figure that is posed something like the thinker. There's a guardian in the background, uh, the, the dog and the flying bird. And of course the fish swimming upstream and the man just has his feet in the water. And, and I'm sure as you all know, and the next painting is called Feeling the Wind. It's this immersion in nature where one can for a moment feel awake. This is Feeling the Wind, again, a kind of immersion in nature. The next paintings, and there are just a few left, are about being, I'd say, being an artist and the, the path forward in this case. So again, we have a beautiful skyscape, but the, the hills are barren. The figure is alone. It's a snow-covered, cold environment, but there are these uh, little way stations where there's heat and a sense of direction. She can move from one way station to the other and survive that way. This painting is Dollhouse Minstrel. Similar to the last painting, but in this case, uh, the minstrel is in a desert, but it's an oasis. There is water there. And off on the side there, she has an audience. There's a snake and there's a lizard on the left and she has an infant there to uh, play her music to, to this audience. And now we have the Fiddler Plays for Nature. And the title kind of says it all. Uh, there, there's no one there, there's no audience. But it's um, the fiddler plays because the fiddler needs to play. It's, it's a striving. You know, we all need to be creative in a way, how in terms of how we shape our life. And in this case, the fiddler uses his fiddle. And, uh, but he's also responsive to, to the nature, to beauty, the beauty of nature. And so this, there's this very peaceful interaction going on, even though he's really all alone. And then the last two paintings, this is Waterfall. And in this case, uh, and I go back to this theme about fear or feeling fear, uh, feeling safe. In this case, the figure is actually in a very precarious situation, but she seems completely unfazed. She's right up at the edge of the cliff and she's uh, just swimming in a way, not swimming, but she's fully immersed in, in the sense of the wind, the beauty of the landscape, the sound of the, the water the glory of it all. She's not afraid. Then finally, we have diving. Uh, again, I mean, she, she's, she don't, I feel this way every time I make a painting. <clears throat> diving into the unknown. I don't know where I'm gonna land. Sometimes it isn't all that much fun, but it, it, there's something glorious about it somewhere along the way and certainly at the very end. 
And so this figure has taken the dive. She's flying with the cranes. We don't know how she's going to land, but she seems confident. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Francie, for talking more about your works. I'm sorry about the echo there for a moment. Um, I'd like to open it up to um, some questions from our audience. So if you do have any questions, make sure that you put them in the Q&A box um, and then we'll just try to get through all of them in the time that we have left. Um, we have one question to kind of get us started from um, an anonymous poster. Um, the question is, you have water per, um, prominently featured in many of the works in this exhibition. Does the water have specific meaning to you? Yeah, I, I, well, I'm, I'm a swimmer and um, I think water is very, uh, me around. <clears throat> water is uh, uh, very sensual, water is, um, what can I say, it's, I guess I think of it as the unconscious in a way. I, I don't mean to sound trite, but when one is underwater, at least my experience swimming, it, it takes the mind to a certain place, uh, a meditative space where things can emerge in the mind that are unexpected, un, unpredictable. And, and also often with the water, there's fish in the water. And that, uh, I guess I always think of, of myself and all of us as we're, we're, we're clever humans with big frontal, lobe, frontal lobes, but we're also like the lizards and we're also like the cow. We have an animal nature. And the fish, we're like the fish. We have drives that, that carry us forward in ways that we don't have much control over. So the water references that aspect of being human. Thank you. And we have another question that just came in from Natalie King. Um, they ask, how has your use of color involved throughout your career as an artist? Some of your paintings make use of strongly pigmented and vibrant colors, while others are more gentle or romantic. Yes, good question. Well, you know, I think a lot of that has to do with, how can I put it? It, it has, partly to do with the material. So in the fire painting with the rabbit, it's very bold color because it's a bold and um, critical moment. In the first painting, which I, I called that where the, the little ceramic dog is uh, on the windowsill, that's a very neutral color. And I think that that has something to do with a kind of shyness. So a lot of color, big color is a way of being very forward. You know, if I talk to you like this and I use a loud voice and you know, it's that's big color or I can talk softly, sit back. And it's, it's just, what, what, is, what am I trying to deliver? A forward message or a very quiet message and that can vary over over time excellent question um we have another one that came in um this one asks the labels provide very little information do you want people to know the stories behind your works how do you want the visitor in, to engage with your work um and then here's it's kind of a three-part question um what do you want them to walk away with after visiting your exhibition well, my greatest dream is that when someone looks at the work, they will find a part of themselves. And my story is really um, pretty insignificant. I, I mean, I think that it's, it's might be interesting to some people, 
who who find biographies are, are are interesting and they want to dwell deeper into the connections between all the works but really my greatest wish is that anyone will walk up to any one of these paintings and just connect on a very personal level and bring their own story to the painting. Thank you. Um, we have another question. It says, this body of work um, spans from 1989 to 1997. Was there something specific taking place in your life that inspired the style of work um, in your examination of experiences from the past? Oh yeah, there was a, <laughs> a lot going on. I mean, it was um, a huge uh, crisis. I was having a huge crisis in my life and I, it, I was, my life was such that I had to make a major dramatic change. And that involved uh, introspection, which I would do partly through my paintings and uh, getting, you know, having conversations with other people uh, and guidance from other people and making big, big, big changes in my lifestyle choices. So there was a lot going on and um, this, is, this is when it happened. Our next question actually kind of leads into that well, um, kind of the other end. And it says, you said as we begin that you moved away from figurative paintings, um, which they put are so delightful and evocative. Um, I'm curious what might have led you to this decision if it was a decision. Uh -huh. Well, um, in, in terms of whether it's a decision or not, I think that the paintings, uh, when I work, I, especially with the figurative work, I would do a sketch, I would have an intention, but really uh, the, the paintings lead the way. And what happened around the end of this cycle, you, you could see the figure gets smaller and the, the landscape became more dominant. And what happened was eventually the landscape became the whole show. And I think what happened was I was just liberated from this narrative. I, I, I was, uh, it's, it's kind of like an archeological dig. I had to kind of dig around in these uh, symbols and stories and I had to discover something. And until I discovered it, I was gonna stay there. And finally, I found the buried treasure, which was a very bad memory. But once I found that, once I understood what it was, and, and um, once it was kind of taken out of the, the being buried and aired out in the world, um, I was able to be liberated from this narrative style of painting. And I got very interested in just throwing paint around and um, using brushes in a wild way. And eventually the, the landscapes turned into abstractions and of landscapes and then they're pure abstractions. So mm, that's, that should be the answer. It's, it's really about evolving. I mean, we all evolve over time in our lives. And this was an evolution that took place but I had to dig around in order to facilitate that change. Um, Sydney Spanner's question actually really connects well to that. Um, they're wondering um, that how kind of your, what your more recent paintings look like. So how they kind of evolved from that. So it is very similar, but I don't know if you could elaborate more on that. Well, you know, go, you can go to my website and see uh, what I'm doing there. The newer paintings are on the front, but basically oh, what I would say is actually, even though the paintings don't look the same at all, they really are the same. They're, I see painting as a practice. Um, it's, it's like this last painting where she's diving into the water. Doing a painting is 
this practice of facing the unknown. You have this blank canvas. And of course, I start with an intention, sometimes more or less, but doing a painting is like having a conversation. And when you're having a, a great conversation, you don't really know where it's going to land or where it's going. And so it's being willing to step into the unknown and practicing that behavior over and over again. In these paintings, I discovered I was looking at fear and coping with fear and coping with the unknown and coping with my, um, my personal history. In my new paintings, I'm just coping with um, my own thoughts and the, the fears that come up in my head. They're not stories anymore about my life. They're more stories about COVID and Black Lives Matter. And they take an abstract form, but they're responsive to my emotional states and what's going on in the world around me. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Elizabeth. Um, they would like to know, is there a particular space or place you like to work in? Um, and also say thank you for sharing your work with them. Oh, thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, yes, I have a, an art studio in New York City and it's my ivory tower. I would not be able to paint without it. And um, I'm very lucky to have that. Any artist that has a workspace is a lucky human being. And, and also it helps, I'm happy that I'm in New York City. New York City has been a, a, a great resource because uh, there are a lot of artists here, writers, intellectuals, uh, uh, theater people, dancers, it's just such a rich environment for uh, the arts. And I, I would be nothing without that community. I wouldn't be able to carry on. So New York is where I, I survive, but I'm, it's not the only place in the world, but I think every artist needs a community. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Natalie King. Um, they say your recent work has explored a new depth of textures and 3D elements within oil paintings. What led you to move into pieces that are almost sculptural in nature? Uh, I think that it's almost like I'm going backwards in development. I think it, it became this um, yearning for uh, a sort of a tactile experience, something about mm, like there's a painting in my hallway. It's all red, it's pure monochrome, but I just swooshed, you know, the, the paint around with, I use trowels and tools. I enjoy almost a violent um, interaction physically with the painting. So it's, it's about a tactile experience. And then of course the the result is all often because it's abstract can be very evocative if you're if you're open to letting your mind just float freely on a, a on some kind of a visual object. Thanks. Oh, we do have another question from an anonymous attendee. Um, they ask, how do you create that sense of the figure being immersed in nature, that immediacy of nature? So I think they're talking more about your figurative works. From the exhibition. So how do I do it? Hmm. Uh, I think it's, I think nothing can feel that way unless it comes from a, a lived experience. I mean, there's technique. I don't know if that's what you're, I'm not sure completely what you're driving at, but certainly there are techniques to make it look like something, some a figure is in nature, but really I think uh, what I hope is that there's an honesty about the work, that when I do a painting of um, a little boat floating off into the sunset, I'm 
living it psychologically and so that it, it should feel right. Uh, if I, I believe that if the emotion isn't honest in the work, then the work will not feel right. That it, there won't be depth to it. Thank you. Um, we do have another anonymous question that came in. Um, they want to know, do you find that poetry or other readings um, aid in your creative process? Yes, I think um, I'm very dependent on great literature, which I read every night. And uh, when I paint, I often listen to jazz and um, I just have to say that and I go to lots of galleries and uh, museums. So I'm very, very dependent on this uh, community of artists. And you know, the, the people uh, like at the Phillips that are showing art and fighting for art. It, there's this huge community and the people in the audience that even have shown up for this artist talk. We're part of a, a big community that's trying to hold on to culture and keep, keep the arts alive because we all sense intuitively that it's really, really important. And so mm, I think I lost track of the question, but I think that I'm very dependent. Uh, that's the point I'm trying to make, very dependent on other artists and art media, and particularly literature and film, by the way. Thank you. Um, we have one another question as well. I just am trying to go through them. Um, this person asked, can you talk more about how art therapy has influenced your work? Oh yeah, well, I think most of you can see my work's very psychological. And certainly uh, in certain corners of the art world, it would not be considered of, of you know, high taste because it is very emotional and uh, it's frequently the figures are alone. They're, in, they're kind of an interior painting paintings and I, I think that I guess what I say is the the psychological I think and I said this before is what unites us uh, and I think that looking inward is a very important practice for everyone in this very complex world we live in um, so I, I hold psychology and art practice and art therapy as in a very high regard. And it does certainly express itself in my work, particularly my, my earlier work. Thank you. Um, we have a question from another anonymous attendee. Um, they ask, do you fall in love with all of your paintings or are there paintings um, particularly that connect to trauma that you feel anger toward or some other negative emotion? Well, each painting is, is kind of like a little marriage or a romance. And so, yes, I fall in love with each painting. And... Um, but I also battle with each painting, especially the later works. I mean, it's such a battle. And sometimes I hate them and sometimes I, I feel hopeless about them. And sometimes I just feel that I'm in paradise. It's a, uh, it's a kind of emotional roller coaster. And that's partly what makes it hard and what makes it an important practice because otherwise I think my uh, impulse would be to go into my cave and hide there. It's just because interacting with other human beings and with life is very challenging. And so it, it takes a certain amount of courage and um, trust. 
So, uh, yes, I fall in love with each painting. But then I, I lose interest and go on to the next. So I'm a very, uh, what's the word? I'm a very, uh, whatever, lover. I, I fickle. <laughs> Thank you. That was a great question. Um, we have another one. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you've lived in an urban or urban environments most of your life. Um, your work seems to focus heavily on nature and landscapes that are very different than cities. Could you talk more about that? Yeah, I grew up in Michigan and every year we spent the summer up near the lake and in the woods and um also when i was a child we had it was the suburbs but there was a little forest nearby and i think that um nature plays a, a very important role for me even walking uh the other day in in washington square park i was so uh, thrilled to be in the snow so i think nature is uh, has been part of my life and it's a great balm uh, for me in my life. Even, even walking down the uh, avenue in New York City, all I have to do is turn my head up and I have the sky. And you know, nature is always there. There's a tree there, there's a sparrow in the bush. So there are little bits of nature around and, and that gives me peace. We do have another question that came in. It's kind of more of a comment, but I don't know if you want to talk more about it. Um, they say, Fiddler playing for nature reminds me of a large rock or island in the Susquehanna River near here that's covered in Native American petroglyphs. Um, they're carved there because the river and sky are like one large bowl. Um, and it's a reflection of sacredness of the earth. And I, I see that in your painting is what they write. Well, well, all I can say is thank you very much. And that's what I want more than anything for uh, the viewer to come and bring their own associations to the work and find meaning, uh, find your own meaning with the work and connect on a deeper level. So that is a, a lovely comment to hear. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. I'm just going through to see what would be a good one to kind of end on? This one you might have kind of answered before, but I don't know if you want to elaborate on it a little bit. It says, in your more recent work, you are no longer using narrative elements and instead are focused on more abstract concerns. What gave you up, uh, what made you give up representational elements and become focused on color field and pure abstraction? So it's a little bit of an overlap, but. Well, I, I do have uh, something to say. At a certain point, I felt that uh, my figurative works were ex exclusionary in a way. So they, you know, it's a boy or it's a girl, it's a white person, it's a young person, it's a child. And so when the central figure is one race or one gender or one age, then it's less of a uh, portal for everybody. And I, I really, um don't want to do that i mean i i love my early work but i really now like the idea that my new work is more open to anyone to bring their own story it's i it's it's, it's as if i'm not telling people what to think or what to feel as much. Now it's more of a kind of a blank canvas, although it's not blank, but there's less information there. And there's more opportunity to bring their own personal experience to the, uh, to the, the painting. 
Thank you, Francie. And I think that's kind of a nice way to end talking about your, your current work. So thank you. thank you for the opportunity. And thank you everyone for being here. Appreciate your um, hanging in here with me. Thank you. Thank you, Francie. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We hope you join us for more programming uh, throughout the rest of the semester. So keep checking our social media and our website for updates about future programming. Um, and also visit the online exhibition to get a closer look at all of Francie's work. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Thank you. Bye. Great. Great.